Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 104, Why a Good GPA is Important. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my intelligent and intuitive co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right today. So, have a good week since our last podcast? Yeah, pretty much. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. So, this podcast uh, actually was suggested to us from one of our listeners. Uh, they, they write for a website, uh, an academic website called Ivy Panda. And uh, they had watched one of our earlier episodes on uh, our academic achievements. And they had pointed me in the direction of the, this article that we're going to cite today. Uh, so I just wanted to give credit uh, to Ivy Panda for, for helping us out with this one. Before we get into that, though, I do want to uh, suggest that folks, if you are interested in the podcast, you uh, subscribe to us. You can get the video versions of our podcast if you subscribe to Insights Into Things. The audio versions of the podcast are available under Insights Into Teens. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, anywhere you can pick up a podcast these days. Uh, and we'd also uh, invite you to give us your feedback and give us suggestions. Uh, we're always looking for new topics to discuss. So tell us what you want us to talk about. We'll do the research and put the shows together. You can email us at comments at insights into things dot com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. We are on Facebook at facebook dot com slash insights into things podcast. You can get us on Instagram at insights into things. Or you can reach out to us directly through our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Shall we get into it? We shall. All right, let us commence shelling. So as I said uh, in the intro, uh, today's article, uh, or today's source that we're using, comes from ivypanda.com. And the first question we ask is, what is a GPA? Madison, why don't you tell us what a GPA is? So GPA stands for grade point average, and it's a number that shows the average of all final grades you've earned o- over time from schooling. So now the one thing to keep in mind with GPA, so when you get your grades now, you're graded on, on a 100 point scale, right? Mm-hmm. Typically, what you see is your GPA is measured in a four-point scale. Okay. So, a hundred in that in your scale would be a four point zero in a GPA scale. Okay. And depending on what that average is, you'll you'll drop below a four point zero, and you know a percentage of that, or or decimal places of that, and so forth. So, typically, if for a GPA, you're shooting for a four point zero for for the highest grade that you can get. Okay. So why is it important to have a good GPA? What are, what are some of the examples? Let's, let's go down this list of examples here. Why don't you start us out? Having an exceptional GPA opens opportunities for you that, y- that you may not otherwise have access to, including academic, professional, and other opportunities. Your GPA is a measure of your success academically, and it is a, me- a me- metric. That's metric. Okay, metric that many people look to not only as a measure of learned knowledge, but all, but of work ethic, dedication, intelligence, and discipline. So, basically what we mean by that is when they look at your GPA, your GPA from a strictly number standpoint 
is a measure of what you've done academically. But you know, being a straight A student, that in order to get that high grade point average, a lot goes into it. Give us some examples of some of the things that go into some of the effort that you have to put forth. Well, one of the main uh, things I have to put forth is problem solving. A lot of times there are points where I don't entirely fully understand something or I have to come up against or I have to answer a question in a way that I um, I need to approach a question in a way I haven't done before. And I need to use problem solving skills in order to solve those problems. Another one would probably be um, uh, time management. Um, I need to make time for all my studies, and I have to make time to study for all of them. I need to make time to get all of them to work while also still balancing my social and um, entertainment life. Exactly. So in order to get that high grade point average, the effort that you put in to get that is a measure of you as a person. So your time management skills, your project management skills, the level of dedication you have to see all that through the level of adaptability you have of taking harder courses. So even though it's the number itself is a measure of just your academic achievement, when people look at that number, there's a lot more that you, you get out of that because of the effort and the uh, dedication that you have to put in to your academic achievements to get that number. So there's a lot more to it than just, hey, I got straight A's. Mm-hmm. So they also talk about the better your score on the GPA scale, the higher your chances you have of getting a prestigious, getting into a prestigious college, or at the very least, it offers you increased opportunities to get into the, your school of choice. Um, when you go to apply for colleges, they're going to look at what your GPA is. And the higher your GPA is, the more colleges you'll be accepted to, especially if you're looking to get into a prestigious college, an Ivy League college or, or something like that, they have very strict requirements on your GPA. So if you don't meet the minimum requirements, they won't even consider your application. Tell us about how it affects your employment. So your GPA affects more of a role in your employment than you might think. The higher your GPA is, the better career you'll the better career start you'll get. You could also receive a job with opportunities and, by, exten by extension, gain a better social life moving forward. Yeah, and I can say, you know, as a department manager myself, uh, I find myself in a position where I have to hire people periodically. And one of the things that we'll look at, depending on the position, is your, your college transcripts, especially if you're coming in as an intern. And if your college transcripts come in and they're above a 3.5 or something like that, it tells us a lot about how hard a worker you are. It tells us what your intelligence level is. It tells us how adaptable you are. And depending on the position that we're putting you in, it's going to tell us a lot about the skills that we're looking for. Uh, so when you, when you go out into the world, when you get to my age, I'll be honest with you, they stop looking at that stuff because it's no longer a measure of the person that you are because of how much you change. But early on in your career, it can be very critical to the getting into the place that you want to get to to get the experience that you want. And that's very important. Your GPA is, uh, only, is the only way to show how well you did with your school subjects. So while you may perform better in certain subjects, the GPA score represents the overall situation. So I may be great in history, and I may excel in history, but I may be terrible in mathematics or science, and that ref is reflected in the GPA. So if you just take one or two courses that you know you're very good at or that you're interested in, those other courses that you're taking could drag down that GPA for you. Mm. So it's an overall reflection of what you're doing in school itself. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the next one. So students with a high GPA have more options available to themselves. 
For example, a good GPA score can help you apply for a scholarship, enroll in different programs, get involved in extracurricular activities, as well as joining clubs and organizations. A good GPA score is a way to show clubs, scholarship communities, universities, and organizations that you're a hardworking student who is capable of reaching your goals and that you have ambitions, and most organizations are looking for those people. And I think that really sums up the benefits themselves. Because the benefit of a high GPA isn't just that you did well in school, it speaks volumes of your character, your work ethic, your capabilities, your ambition. So it, it tells a, per, a prospective college or employer a lot about who you are as a person because you got to figure, let's take a job interview for instance. So when you go to apply for a job, you put together a, a resume or or a CV or something like that that shows why you should be picked for the job. And if you're fresh out of college or fresh out of high school, you don't have a lot of experience to put down there. Mm -hmm. So the one thing that you have going for you at that point, if you have a high GPA, is you put that down and you put down the courses that you've taken and the experiences in clubs and, and so forth that you were involved in. And the interviewer looks at that and can kind of – get a, a good assessment of the type of person that you are. Mm -hmm. So if you come in with a, a 3.9 GPA and you're in, you know, the debate club and the chess club and you're an athlete, it tells me as the interviewer, well, you can do all these other things and still excel academically. So yeah, the, the academic side of it, you're very intelligent, but you're capable of doing more than just academics. Yeah. Um, and it and it tells me that you're a hard worker. So these are all things that an employer is going to look for. Um, and the colleges, and we'll get a little bit more into the colleges later on, but the colleges are definitely going to look at your GPA because some of them aren't even going to accept you because of the rejection rate that they have. Mm -hmm. um, there are colleges out there that that you know they pretty much accept anybody that applies to them, but that might not be the type of college you want to go to. So when you have the high GPA, that's kind of the collateral that you need to to get into the more prestigious colleges that you want to get into. Mm -hmm. So let's take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll we'll look at what are some of the benefits to you as an individual with a good GPA. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to episode 104 of Insights into Teens. We're talking about why it's important to have a good GPA. So some of the benefits include broader opportunities. So the major and most important benefit of good grades is much bigger selection of opportunities. From elite high school programs, which you were able to get into because of your grades, to better chances of getting a scholarship, which you're going to start looking at in the next few years as you get further into high school to greater odds of receiving a well-paying job, or at least the job that you're looking to get into. Okay. Uh, this benefit alone is too, is too good not to pass up and is a great motivation to try and do your best in school. Ultimately putting in the effort to earn higher grades pays off later in life. Um, and the one thing and I can't emphasize enough <clears throat> 
the importance of being able to get into the job that you're looking to get into. That early experience is something that can snowball and build into a much better paying job, a much better long-term career, and it has a huge influence on things moving forward. Okay. What's our next benefit? Our next benefit is a wider selection of universities. Some colleges and universities accept almost every high school graduate who applies. Others are more select are much more selective and have a certain percentage of students allowed to go to their institution. There are also universities that decline most students that apply, accepting only 25% or less of the students that do apply. The high uh, this is why GPA plays a role, plays a crucial role in the selection process. The higher your GPA score is, the more universities will accept you and the more options you have available to you. And then we talk about scholarships. We, we touched on this before, and I think a lot of people tend to think of athletics when they think of scholarships. You know, you think you do very good in football or basketball and you get, a, you get a scholarship to go to college for free. But in reality, there's a ton of scholarships out there for academic achievements. So if you can do well in school, get a high GPA, get all the other benefits that we've talked about already, and then have that partially or totally pay for your college as part of a scholarship, that's, that's a win-win all around. Most financial aid programs for students have a set, strict set of requirements for your GPA. So if you drop below that, they won't finance you. Mm. Almost all of them do define a minimum GPA score. And knowing the fact that scholarships are given to a limited number of students, it's clear that an above average GPA makes you eligible for more scholarship programs, which also gives you a better chance of getting into one. So anything that increases your chances of being a more viable candidate is a good thing. Mm -hmm. What's next? Next up, we have the ability to get involved in extracurricular activities. Some say if you study hard, there will be no time left for anything extra. Look at it, look at it from a different point of view. If you decide not to try out for a sports team, the coach will... Oh, wait, no. <laughs> If you decide to try out for a sports team, the coach will check your your uh, eligibility. Eligibility. Apart from your physical capabilities, the coach will also check your academic performance, including GPA scores. If they're high, the coach won't have to worry that one day you that one day you'll drop out of the team because you failed an exam. Yeah, and this is a good example here too of of an unintended consequence. So. The one example they give here is that if you have a good GPA, the coach will know that you're going to be able to stick with the team. The problem a lot of students don't realize is that most of your schools, your high schools at least, have minimum re uh, academic requirements to participate in extracurricular activities. So, for instance, and they do this for your benefit. It's not to punish you or anything like that. If you go out for basketball, for instance, and you're a straight A student and you start playing basketball after school and you're practicing and it's taking a lot of your time and your weekend time and you're exhausted all the time and they see your grades start to drop, they're going to pull you out of that program because the program itself is affecting you negatively with your academics. So having that GPA allows you and maintaining that GPA allows you to participate in these schools and these programs, rather. And we're not just talking about sports programs. We're talking about band or drama club or the debate club or chess or anything else that you want to do. If they see that it's affecting you academically, they're not going to allow you to do those things. And certainly your parents probably aren't going to allow you to continue doing it. Mm. But – you know, it's it's also a confidence builder for the coaches and the you know team captains to know that you know you're able to not only do academics very well, but you're able to do the sports on top of it. And that's sort of what we alluded to earlier about how it reflects well on you that you're capable of doing multiple things. You can also benefit with a career boost. 
So the world's top colleges and companies have that status of being at the top for a reason. To be able to be a part of top colleges and companies, you must prove that you deserve it. You can say you're a hard worker and show your charming personality, but people on admissions committees and at job interviews prefer to believe the facts and the actual achievements. Mm -hmm. In order for you to your career to skyrocket from the start, lay the foundation for it right away by earning good grades. I've interviewed with a lot of people. They were smooth talkers. They were very eloquent and very friendly, and I got along with them great. But if they couldn't demonstrate to me or show to me proof that they were competent for the job, I couldn't consider them. You know, as much as I may have liked the person sitting across the desk from me, I can't give you a job because you're a nice person. I'm not hiring. At no point in time am I hiring for a position called nice person. <laughs> so having that documented proof that you can do the work is very important. Mm -hmm. How about your confidence? How does it affect your confidence? Well, improved confidence. Outstanding achievements require hard work. If you're too afraid to put all your effort into reaching a goal, you'll never know how it feels to get there. It may be difficult when you first start, but once you begin succeeding, your confidence grows. When your confidence grows, it won't be scary to go all in anymore. You begin to build on that on that earned confidence and realize how much you can accomplish. And this is something that you and I have discussed repeatedly in the past with your academics. The fact that you are repeatedly successful and consistently successful at what you do with the grades that you bring home, but you don't have the confidence moving forward. The longer you're consistently effective at academics, the more that confidence will build. And over time, you're going to start understanding that the challenges that you face aren't insurmountable challenges. And eventually, and even to a certain extent now because of the, uh, the more advanced courses that you're taking, you're going to want to challenge yourself. That confidence level is going to get you to the point that you want to challenge yourself and do harder things. And that all is reflected in your GPA as well. The last benefit we have to talk about here is better personal image. So a high GPA shows more than how good you are as a student. Everyone knows it takes great effort to get those high grades, and your GPA is evidence that you're capable and willing to work hard to achieve your goals. It shows that you're able to maintain consistency during schooling. It's a sign of your commitment, time management skills, and ability to handle tough assignments. And this kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier in the first segment, that your GPA isn't just a reflection of you scholastically. It's a statement of the traits and qualities that you have that allow you to be so uh, accomplished scholastically. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the good benefits. But with every good benefit, there are some downsides, right? Yep. Why don't you tell us about some of the downsides? So one of the main downsides is having to prove yourself more. Talking to an administration's committee or having a job interview will always be a challenge if you have a low GPA. The thing is that you'll have to make people believe that you believe you about your other positive aspects and that you really are a good student despite your lacking academic performance. It could even come to having to format and, compo and compose your resumes and cover letters in a specific way to avoid scrutiny of a low GPA. Yes, and this is something that I've seen cross my desk a number of times. In fact, I'm, I'm hiring for a position now that I would say probably 60% of the people aren't qualified for the position just looking at their resume. And the problem you have is that if your GPA is not acceptable, we'll say. I'm not saying you have to come in with a 4.0, but if it's below a 3 or or, or lower than that, then the majority of the time you spend at a job interview is trying to sell yourself. And that gets very hard if you're not a salesperson. Mm -hmm. With a high GPA when you walk in, the paperwork is there. It's like walking in with, the, with degrees right off the bat. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the evidence is there, it sells you. Then the interviewer has a chance to get to know you and just be more casual and talk. And you can be yourself at that point in time. You're not putting on a sales pitch. Yeah. So it makes interviews so much easier. The other downside that you have is a bad image. Earning good grades means having to find compromises and push through difficult tasks and assignments. A low GPA shows that you were unable to face these tasks, even though it was the goal you needed to achieve. Even if you'll claim that you have good and diverse personality, your GPA score may contradict that. It's very hard. This is a first impression type thing, and they tell you that first impressions are the most important. When you walk in and someone sees that you have a low GPA, it immediately sets a negative tone to the interview. And then you have to spend the rest of the interview overcoming that. So that's one of the pitfalls that you have going into just a job interview. But, you know, there are times you won't even get your foot in the door or get a job interview when you come in with too low a GPA or, or certainly for a college admissions board. Wow. What's the next one we have? So the next one is lacking skills and knowledge. Even if you paid full attention in the subjects that interested you and neglected others, it's still bad news. Your low GPA only means that you've missed out on developing your logic, critical thinking, and were unable to shift your attitude toward working on a higher overall score instead of focusing on a single subject. Even if you're an outstanding expert in your field, there is still some basic knowledge you need to have. If you're in a situation where that knowledge is required, you risk embarrassing yourself or com- or compromising com- or compromising a project you may be participating in. Yeah, and that kind of goes back to what we we're talking about before, where if you're not competent for a job, but you do manage to sell yourself and get hired for it, then what do you do? You know, if you don't have the skills, if you didn't have the skills to get the GPA in the first place and didn't put the effort in and didn't develop the time management skills, and you find yourself in a position where you have to manage a project or, or produce something, and you don't really have those skills, what do you do then? Yeah. I mean, that's a very difficult position to be in at that point. Mm-hmm. And the last thing you want to do is let down your employer or lean on your coworkers and have them carry you because you can't do that through your whole life. You might be able to skirt by one or two projects. You know, this, it kind of makes me think of when you have group projects at school and the other members in your group don't participate as much as they should and you carry the whole group. You make them look good because of how good you are. But the next project that they're on, they might not have you as a partner and they might have someone like them as a partner. And then what do they do? They don't learn anything at that point. Yeah. And if you continue to do th- do that through your scholastic career and you let other people carry you, there comes a point where they're going to stop. Someone's going to stop carrying you. You have to deliver at some point in time. Mm-hmm. And if you've been doing that for years, you're kind of left in a lurch there. You can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. So we did talk about time management. So inconsistencies in your grades that led to a low GPA can show you couldn't manage your priorities and leave enough time for all classes. This isn't a good sign when you're applying for a job or when you try to enter university. If that's not enough, some might even interpret it as a lack of self-discipline because you couldn't push yourself to earn the desired score. So again, it's a reflection of yourself. So what's the last one that we have here? The last one is other people's judgment. GPA is not only an extremely important metric in modern education, but it's also important that other but it's also important that other people may build their whole judgment about you as a person around your GPA only, which kind of sound which I'm not sure if you want to do that entirely, but sure, I guess I don't know. Yeah, it's probably not a good thing, but like they say, some people do that because that's. If you don't come up with a good GPA, you're not even going to get people's attention. 
A higher GPA can be correlated to higher intelligence, better dedication and commitment, willing to work hard and meet up and meet your obligations. But a low GPA can be interpreted as the exact opposite. Right. You know, with a low GPA, people look at that and they think, well, you didn't really apply yourself. Or maybe you're lazy. Or maybe you, you aren't that intelligent. Maybe you don't have the qualities that we're looking for in our students at this college. Uh, maybe you don't have the ability to do the job that we're looking to hire you for. When you come in with those negative impressions with a low GPA, it's an uphill battle at that point in time. You may be able to do the job. Maybe you coast it through high school. People do that. You know, maybe you're a lot smarter than what the piece of paper in front of you says. But you have to prove that. Yeah. You know, and instead of walking in with a piece of paper that says I'm that smart, it's it does the job for you at that point. So there's definitely detriments to low GPAs. So we're going to take our last break here and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about some ideas on how to improve your GPA. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. So how do you improve your GPA? And I think the first thing we should talk about is the fact that you need to know what your GPA is. And if you see that your GPA isn't that high, don't leave it that way. Do something about it. There's a couple of ways, you know, we'll talk about a couple of ways that you can improve your score, but you need to make sure you're looking at what your, your grades are on a regular basis, because as you move along, you'll find it's a lot easier to keep them up if you see a dip anywhere along the lines. Mm -hmm. What's our first tip on how to improve your GPA? So the first tip is take, is take difficult classes. This might seem counterintuitive, but more challenge can bring more improvement. With more challenges, you'll progress faster and earn grades that you deserve. This mainly applies to people with a good enough GPA, but who want to improve it. And I think this is a great example of what you're doing right now. You're in how many advanced classes right now? Three. So you're in three. Now you're moving into the college prep courses that you're going to be starting at the, on the academy level when you go into the high school next year. How did you take the difficulty? Because you moved from one advanced class to three advanced classes from last year to this year. How did that impact you from a workload and difficulty standpoint? Well, I will say I was definitely expected of more. Like, I would have live classes with my advanced science and um, history teachers, which were the extra classes I was uh, taking for advanced. And there were a lot of times where they said, like, since you're in advance, I expect you to do this. And a lot of time it was referring to how much work we were doing and how our work should look like. And um, I will say the, te um, the tests were a little more difficult. I kind of had to learn the flow of each of them. So... Um, yeah, it was kind of difficult, and I was expected of more, um, but I did end up getting kind of used to it. Yeah, the expectations go up. There's there's less hand-holding. Uh, there's more expectation for independent work and independent thinking. 
And all of that drives you towards, you know, going to college because you're not going to get handheld in college. What's the next hint that we have? Uh, the next one we have is ask for help. There's nothing wrong with asking for assistance when you need it. Many students who experience difficulties make the same mistake. They, ke they keep silent about it. Asking for help is a smarter decision than trying to figure out the solution to the problem on your own. That's probably really important at the high school level because the teachers are there to educate you. Uh, it's their job to make you succeed. Uh, with that in mind, how are you about asking for help when you don't understand something? I definitely think I'm better than I was before. When I was in seventh and sixth, mainly seventh grade, I was always kind of scared to raise my hand to either answer a question or ask a question because I'd think, I'd either think, well, my answer's stupid or my question's stupid or maybe I'm disrupting them or maybe she can't help me or... I just kind of went through all those problems in my head. Um, and I guess since I've been online for school now, um, asking for question, asking questions has kind of been easier for me. And I kind of know that asking questions is better and I have gotten extra help with them. So yeah, I'm better than where I was. Well, that's good. Yeah. I guess, I guess working online because you can directly message the teacher. You're not. You know, the focus of the class isn't on you when you're asking a question. Yeah. I could certainly see that. And and the fact that you're seeing re good results from that's important. My philosophy has always been the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. Mm. There's never any question you shouldn't ask. You should always feel comfortable doing that. What's our next hint? Um, our next hint is focus on your studies and follow the schedule. You need to fight the urge to procrastinate. Uh, creating an individual schedule can help you focus on achieving your goals. Have a session of critical thinking and work on your study habits. This usually shows areas that need improvement. So how are you at keeping your schedule? Especially now that you're, you're working, you know, you're schooling from home. It's got to be difficult to keep a schedule. I mean, especially when we first started because it was really kind of crazy when we first started. We didn't really have a schedule. It was just, okay, all your classes gave you work. Just do it by the end of the day or do it when we think it's due. Now we do actually have periods for it, and I am able to better keep my schedule for that. Um, and for after school, if I do have work I need to do, I focus on one thing, get that done, then focus on another thing, get that done, and I kind of have a set schedule in a way. Yeah, there's a there's a, an overall lack of appreciation, I think, for routine. You know, the routines that we get into on a day-to-day -day basis really help us to keep our focus, to keep us organized, and to a certain extent, to motivate us. You know, if I know that I'm going to get out of school at a certain time, then I'm going to work to that goal. If I know that lunch is right around the corner and my stomach's growling, then I'm going to work to get my stuff done. So it's these little milestones um, that, that help. And when you, when you get out into the real world and you're, you're working a job, you sort of set those for yourself as well. And usually they tend to revolve around time off or holidays or something like that, uh, or projects. You know, if I know I have a project that I'm working on now, that project usually is planned out to the point where I know when it's going to end roughly. And you work at a pace to get to that point so that when you get to that point, you have a chance, you sprint up to that point and you have a chance to take a breather. Uh, so scheduling and, and routine are very helpful. What's next? Next up is find the right balance. Finding balance is a challenge many students fail. It seems that they aren't... Mm, it seems they... Um, it seems that they can't figure out where to draw the line between... so between studies and social life, which normally results in poor academic performance. Spend a couple days monitoring how, e how much time you spend on different activities, then make the necessary adjustments. And one of the advantages I think we have right now is there really isn't much social life. Mm. But before the pandemic happened, how did you find that balance? Because obviously it didn't, your grades have been very good for 
quite some time now. So you must have struck a balance there somewhere. How did you do that? Well, um, I'll start off where, um, when I was in sixth grade, which, uh, still was an interesting time in my life. Um, it was kind of where I tried to find the balance at that point. Um, and when I was doing my schoolwork, um, in aftercare, um, I guess I would kind of balance my social life at the same time. Like, I'd get my work done, um, and then I'd go and do something else. My work always came first, and then when I was done, I would go and be social. And even when I was doing my work, I was kind of able to be social because my one friend was younger than me and would usually sometimes need help with her work, and I would always be there to assist. And it was never too hard to the po- It was- she never really asked to- she never really distracted me like everything else did. Um, me and her were just working on our schoolwork, and it was kind of regular. By the time I was in seventh grade and I didn't have aftercare, I was able to focus more on my studies, and since I really didn't have any clubs at the time, I didn't really um, have a social life outside of school, besides, of course, texting my friends and stuff. Um, but in school, I would have my one friend at... I would talk with my one friend at lunch, and my friend my friend Mariah and I would go to our buses together um, once I was done in my locker, so we had a bit of extra time to talk. So it sounds like prioritization really is what gave you that, that balance. Mm-hmm. Uh, you always prioritized your, your academics over your social life. Mm-hmm. That might get harder as you get older and you get further into high school, where social, you're going to have much more... Uh, demands from the social side of, of things are going to be tugging at you a little bit more than you were used to. So yeah, you just kind of have to keep that in mind. What the, what's our next one? The next up, next we have uh, know your strengths and weaknesses. Pick the subjects you're interested in the most and keep in mind that the more classes you take, the less influence each class is going to have on your GPA. It doesn't mean that you need to cram your schedule full. Just pick what you think will keep you interested. How do you think you are at at determining what your strengths and weaknesses are? Well, I definitely know that I'm very strong in my academics, and I also know which hobbies I'm strong in and what I'm weak in. And when it comes to my academic subjects, I know which ones I'm better in and I know which ones I'm worse in. So, I kind of I definitely don't shy away from my weaknesses, and I try to highlight my strengths as well. So are there any academic habits you have that you think need to be improved? Um, I guess more or less understanding that my that I do have strengths. Uh, like I said, I'm not afraid to show my weak to know my weaknesses. But I do sometimes, but I do sometimes overshadow my strengths. Although I, I am aware of a lot of them. Sometimes they do get overshadowed. Um, just because I kind of, I guess, just focus on accepting my weaknesses more. Right. That makes sense. What's the last one that we have? The last one we have is set small goals and give yourself rewards. Instead of having one big goal of improving your GPA, have a set of smaller, more realistic goals that you can achieve in a shorter amount of time. Satisfying rewards will keep you motivated, so you'll lower the chance of losing interest and dropping the whole idea. Yeah, and this kind of goes along the the problem-solving philosophy that we've, we've talked about a number of times on the podcast. And that is take those bigger challenges that you have and find a way to, to divide them up into smaller goals, smaller smaller pieces. And then you attack those pieces individually. And eventually you start seeing the progress that you're making and those pieces that you've conquered and, and solved start to assemble like a puzzle until eventually you've got the whole thing solved. Yep. Because you'll find from a inspiration and motivation standpoint and even from a morale standpoint it's a lot easier to break things into smaller chunks and start getting some of those early victories what we we like to call you know the low-hanging fruit let's establish some uh, triumphs right off the bat here 
Let's get a couple of wins under our belt. Then we're going to feel good about it. We're going to be motivated to continue on. And then we'll start getting the more progressively difficult things done. And before you know it, you're 90% of the way there. You're almost done. Um, so dividing things into smaller uh, batches is very important. And giving yourself rewards. You know, the reward could be finishing one of those projects and solving one of those things. The other thing could just be, all right, I'm going to work on this term paper until such and such time. And the reward that I get, you know, I'm going to go get something to drink or I'm going to get up and stretch or something like that. And you work in, in little shifts like that so that you, you keep yourself motivated so that you're not sitting there getting bored or distracted. You don't want your mind wandering. You need to take those little breaks, those little rewards, go play video games for a little bit and veg out, clear your head, come back and start anew. You know, one of the things that I always say is if you're working on a problem and you're too close to it, you need to step away for a little bit and you need to clear your head. Then you step back into it. You can look at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So these are all really good uh, suggestions on how to improve your GPA. Uh, obviously, right now, they're not things that you need to worry about because your GPA is high enough. But there's a lot of people out there that could probably use a little bit of help in that area. I hope we've kind of uh, done the article at I've, uh, Ivy Panda justice here and emphasize the importance of how your GPA can affect you academically, professionally, personally, and talked about some of the high points there. We'll be right back and we'll get your closing remarks. All righty. Go for your closing remarks. All right, so to anyone out there who is looking to improve their GPA for if, if it is low or if for just of the sake of improving it, I would recommend that you would try out some of these, um, some of the things we mentioned here. And if these are not enough for you, go ahead and try and find other things ways get insight from others who have had the same experience as you um and stay in school stay in school yeah okay <laughs> sage advice as usual thank you uh don't, you don't have to hit the microphone there's no need I to get didn't violent. mean to hit it uh before we go i would also i would once again suggest you subscribe to the podcast video versions can be found listed as insights into things Audio versions of the podcast are listed as Insights into Teens. You'll find us on Apple Sp uh, Podcasts, Spotify, Google Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Castro, Amazon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we would also love to get your feedback. This article or this episode was uh, thanks to feedback from one of our listeners. We would love to get more feedback on topics you'd like us to discuss. Topics you'd like us not to discuss. Um, tell us how we're doing, how we're how we can improve. We're always looking to improve. You can email us suggestions over to comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can also get high res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We do stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Uh, just a side note, if you have Amazon Prime. You also get a Twitch Prime monthly subscription. We would very much appreciate it if you threw that our way. It helps us out a lot. Audio versions of the podcast can be found at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. You can give us feedback on Facebook at facebook.com slash insightsintothingspodcast. You can get us on Instagram at insightsintothings, or you can go right to our website at www.insightsintothings.com and give us your feedback. And you... And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights and Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and, it, and Insights in the Tomorrow, our monthly podcast hosted by you and my brother Sam. Well done. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.